Well, we are in the sixth chapter of the book of Hosea. <laughs> you can get me fired over here. This is one of the most dynamic chapters in the Bible. It, it's amazing. And we've all quoted from it from time to time, but to see how God put it together and the place in which He put it together is phenomenal. Um, I've been trying to cover at least one chapter per week. This, this week we will cover three scriptures, scriptures one, two, and three from the sixth chapter of Hosea. However, I didn't know that when I wrote out my forward. So let's read my forward here. The sixth chapter in the book of Hosea is a short but dynamic piece of prophecy. This chapter has very definite overtones of messianic prophecies. The reference to two and three days refers not only to the death and resurrection of Christ, but also can point forward to a future timeline of restoration for the entire human race. That's big. <clears throat> Also, the association of the former and latter reigns is also a parallel to the prophecies of Joel, which we'll be doing Joel right after we finish with Hosea. Tonight we will look at the meaning of these terms and even visit the Pentecostal movement that was sparked by the, quote, latter reigns in the, in the mid-1900s. Uh, by the way, we're not going to do that tonight because I never got past the first part when I started my writing. And as I was writing and writing and writing, I thought of Barbara and Barbara. <laughs> and after I got to page four, I decided, you know what? People would like me a lot better if I would stop. <laughs> so we have that whole thing to look forward to about the uh, Pentecostal movement concerning, concerning the latter range. But we will get to the latter range. Uh, also tonight we will deal with the comment made by Jesus, which was recorded in Matthew on two occasions. Mm -hmm. This comment was, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Some very powerful statements made in Hosea chapter 6. This chapter is full of parallels prop to, of prophecies to other books in our Bible. Another interesting reference to our scripture tonight is that of the first three verses are given to us in the form of a prayer, a prayer of repentance. Now you always want to keep in mind that this book is exhibiting the real-life drama of a real-life person by the name of Hosea. And as Hosea feels his pain, the people are hearing God's pain. It is kind of interesting why God chose the scriptures that we're about to read tonight to give to Hosea, which is a depiction of a man who was told by God to marry a harlot. Uh, and through that marriage, uh, we know, of course, that Mr. Hosea had to love Gomer, or else the picture wouldn't be a perfect picture. Uh, the thing that we need to keep looking at is, however, is not Hosea's pain, but it's God's pain that's being exhibited here to the people. So let us get right down to it. There's a lot of stuff here in the first three verses. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. This verse is said in such a way that it could easily be a prayer from our prayer to God from the prophet Hosea. See the words he's saying, come. Uh, like we were all sitting here, come, let us all return to the Lord. It's coming from the mouth of Hosea. Okay? Yeah. Uh, but remember, he's also going through the same thing himself. Yeah. Uh, and his prayer, he's getting ready to punish Gomer <coughs> for her sins. And he would be saying the same thing to Gomer. Come. Uh, Let's return, return unto me, is what he would be saying to Gomer. But as the prophet of God, he says, Come, <clears throat> 
and let us return to the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal us. Remember back in well, two weeks ago where uh, we studied a scripture in, in chapter 4, and it said that God would come as a lion and he would tear Israel apart. Do you remember that scripture? I've got a quote of here somewhere. Uh, here it says, For he has torn, but he will heal us. Do you remember in the first the, the, of the chapter, or the first part of uh, Hosea, chapters 1, 2, and 3, where they had descriptions of the children that were born? You had La uh, Ruhama, which says no mercy. Remember that? Yeah. La Ruhama. And uh, Lo Ami, which meant no, no mercy. And uh, in reality, God will have mercy. And lo and me, of course, meant you're not my people, not my people, lo and me. And these names that were given to Hosea's children were reminders as the children walked around through the village or wherever it was that Mr. Hosea lived of what God was trying to say to the people, that he wasn't going to have mercy on them. He was, in fact, he was going to tell them, you are not my people. But then, in that same chapter, in the same place where I said to them that they will not be my people, he said to them, you are my people. So there is a time coming when they will go into uh, Assyria and they will be taken captive. But a time is coming when they will come back into the land and there God will say to them, you are my people. This verse is said in such a way that it could easily be a prayer to God from the prophet Hosea. He is addressing the people and he begs them to come, return to the Lord. The last five chapters have been accusations of harlotry, idolatry, and unfaithfulness and have described the many other ways that God's people Israel have misbehaved. For those reasons, God took them to court, as would a husband of an unfaithful wife, as did Mr. Hosea to his wife. He has pronounced judgment upon them, and that judgment will come. Notice I've underlined that. That judgment has been pronounced, and it's going to happen. Just like judgment was pronounced against this world 2,000 years ago yes. in the Revelation, actually even before that, because it's called the great and dreadful day of the Lord, even in the Old Testament. Judgment has been pronounced many, 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 many years ago, and that judgment will happen. That judgment, however, is not disowning, but rather chastisement. So, he will bring his people back into the land. Thus the prophet begs the people to, quote, return to the Lord, even though he has torn them. The word torn is referring back to chapters uh, 5, 14, I'm sorry, not 4, chapters 5, 14. It was there that God refers to himself as a lion who will tear them apart. Uh, if Israel will not return to him, Hosea says that, oh, if Israel will return to him, Hosea now says that he will heal us. And of course, we know the end of the story. We have the end of the story, do we not? We have the book of Revelation, which is God's final word to mankind on planet earth and we, we see Israel being healed in the last days and we have the book of Ezekiel as well which tells of the entrance into the millennial kingdom uh, yeah, <clears throat> yes they have been given punishment for their sins but that punishment is for their good you ever heard that it's yeah. a picture of a father who's this is for the Taking off his belt. <laughs> Remember dad? Montana belt. <clears throat> yeah, Montana. This is a picture of father just banking his child and saying, this is going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. And you're going, mm -hmm. if you're the kid getting mm -hmm. punished, you don't think that, right? Well, right. Israel is the kid being punished mm -hmm. and they're not thinking that right now. <clears throat> they're only thinking they're going to get a spanking. Um, Hosea is telling the people to understand the punishment, but not to take the punishment as a total rejection. From God. He has stricken, but he will bind us up, says Jose. The day will come. I've underlined that word day because we're going to be talking a lot about the day today. 
That day will come when Israel, Ephraim and Judah, remember the country at this point in time has fled some 200 years before Hosea under the uh, leadership of the north by Jeroboam. And Judah, Judah remained in the south. In Judah they had uh, the city, of course, of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and But Israel, most of Israel, 10 tribes of Israel were all in the north. Sometimes that country was referred to as Ephraim. Sometimes it was just called Israel. But the true Israel will be when Ephraim and the Judah will be completely reunited as the children of the true and living God. That day is the subject of the next verse. Here's the next verse. <clears throat> While well, it's a verse. After two days, this is telling us when they're going to get restored, everybody. Remember, they're going into, they are going into captivity. They've since become known as the lost tribes of Israel, correct? Mm -hmm. Do we know where they are today? No, God but God says they were going to, he's going to restore them after two days. It says, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we might live in his sight. So if it's been more than 2,000 years, actually it's been 27 years, 27. you can't look at this two days as a literal two days or a three days, can you? No. I mean, it just doesn't fit. Because we know they weren't, they, they didn't just go into Assyria for captivity for two days and they came back out. So we, we know that. It wasn't just a battle. But the day of restoration will come in two stages. After two days, God promises to revive them. But on the third day, that's important, that on the third day, the third day comes after what? The second day, right? Sometimes scripture gets really complicated. So you have to understand. On the third day, he's going to raise them up that they might live in his sight. Has that happened yet? No. No, well, that hasn't happened yet. Obviously, God is not going to take them into Assyrian captivity for only two or three days, literal days. Therefore, this time, this time period must somehow be symbolic, not literal. And now I teach, most of the time, and you guys know this, I teach that people should take the Bible literally for what it says. Except when it's obvious that it's not literal. I mean, this is obviously not literal, because they, and we know from history that they didn't do that. Most people believe this is a direct messianic prophecy pointing to the death and resurrection of Jesus Did Christ. Timothy say to God uh, a day is a thousand years? Or no, no, it wasn't Timothy. Um, I just read it. So Paul, yeah. Paul wrote it to Paul Timothy. Paul wrote it to Timothy. Yeah, in the Paul wrote it to Timothy. I oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. That was Peter. That said that. Peter, second Peter. Peter. Second Peter. Uh, most people believe that this is direct messianic prophecy pointing to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Looking back, we know that Jesus died and was in the grave for two days, and what? On the third day, he rose. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Jesus yeah. was in the grave mm -hmm. two days, which was Friday, Saturday, and on Sunday, he rose. Yeah. We, all re we all come together on, on Easter Sunday. Not Easter Saturday, not Easter Monday, but Easter Sunday. And on the third day, he rose. Okay. So, read this verse carefully and you will see the parallel to Jesus' statement, which is in Matthew 12, 40. Jesus said this to the Pharisees. For as Jonah was three days and three nights, now it's worded a little different, three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, I'm not going to go heavily into my Thursday speech, okay? okay? But you guys have all heard it. The only way this scripture could be fulfilled was a, was a death of, on the cross on a Thursday. Because yeah. you, cannot, you cannot get... Uh, 
You cannot get three days and three nights out of a Friday crucifixion. You just you can try as much as you want, but you cannot get it. You can say, oh, any little portion of, but if Jesus died Thursday afternoon and it went into uh, Friday, there's Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night begins before. And on the third day, he rose. Yeah. Okay? So I'm not going to go in heavy into that, but that fulfills the requirement of the of the three days and three nights. Okay? <laughs> Although Hosea describes this period as two or three days, it clearly reflects the same idea as does the scripture in Matthew. Can everybody see that? It's just worded differently. Yep. But I want you to pay attention to the fact that it is worded differently. And you, when that happens, you sometimes have to ask the reason, why is it worded differently? Now, you won't find anything, you won't find too much on this. So, here we go with Wayne. Okay. Here we go, loop-de-loop. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Question, why did God refer to the same timeline once as two and three days, and then Matthew as three days and three nights. Could it be that there's also another meaning? I do believe so. And it's not something that's that we haven't discussed before. In fact, uh, we showed a whole uh, movie one night about the bear sheep prophecy. Remember that? And a timeline. Now, I'm, I'm not setting a date, okay? I'm not setting the date, but it does show a timeline. There is a timeline that's being given to us, and it's being given to us right here in Hosea. Yes. Now, in the Old Testament, understand this. Prophecies that were given were seldom understood by the prophet who spoke or wrote the prophetic word. Uh, for example, Hosea didn't have any idea why he was telling the people, don't worry, you're going into a Syrian captive, uh, but you're coming out in two days. And by the way, on the third day, God's going to revive us all. Wasn't that his prayer? Isn't that what he just read? Isn't that what he told the people? Isn't that what God re recorded for us in the book of Hosea? Yep. It has got to have additional meaning. And I don't believe that even Mr. Hosea knew what he was saying. He was writing down what God gave him to write. Yeah. Oftentimes, Words had a short-term meaning, but also many prophecies were long-term and would be fulfilled in the latter years. Hosea, in giving Israel a two- and three-day prophecy, was telling the people that their punishment was not permanent and would soon be over, a reference to the number two, which is a low number, correct? Mm -hmm. So he gave them a low number. Yeah. Soon after their punishment, they would completely be restored, which is a reference to the number three. He's trying to encourage the people, saying, oh, you're not going to be there for a long time. God's calling it two or three days, but we know that it's going to be longer than that. You're going to go into captivity. He's telling them they were going into captivity. That was the choice that God was giving them. They are going into captivity. Just like Jeremiah was telling the, uh, the people, inside the walls of Jerusalem to go out and surrender to Nebuchadnezzar because God had brought the armies of Nebuchadnezzar against the, the nation of Judah and they were going to go into captivity and it would be best if they would surrender. And the king had him thrown into prison. Do you remember that? For even making such a statement. Mm -hmm. But that's what God was telling him. Go do it. This has been, hey, it's going to happen. God's proclaimed it's going to happen. He's going to give you over into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. Same thing. You're going to go into the hands of Sennacherib, the, the ruler of, uh, at that time, of Assyria. <clears throat> okay, let's continue. Peter, in his second epistle, wrote that a day is like a thousand years. Here's the scripture, Gita. Yeah, second Peter 3.8. But well, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. Now, again, I teach that you can pretty much take things literal. A lot of people teach that that thousand years just means that a day is a long time for the Lord. Okay? And you can have that meaning as you want. 
But I'm seeing something here that's very, very, very prophetic. Stay with me. This scripture in 2 Peter was given to who? To Israel? No, to the church. Given to the church. Peter was an apostle, of course, and Which he was given the church. Uh, and now the church, us, we're sitting here reading Hosea's Old Testament scripture, which was given to Israel, uh, both the northern and the southern kingdom, in Judah. And we're attempting to look at this prophecy from our vantage point. And we've been given this new piece of information some seven, eight hundred years after the Assyrian captivity. to analyze what Hosea had to say. That a day is like a thousand years. Hosea, okay, looking at this property from our vantage point, we can see that it clearly points to the cross of Jesus. Okay? That cross came when? In the year of 30 A.D. Jesus was 33 and a half. Jesus was actually born, he was either four, some people even say five, uh, at the time that he died. But most people believe he was 33 and a half, which kind of correlates with a lot of other scriptures, uh, which means he was born probably in 4 BC, yeah. not born in, in the year of 1 AD, like they tried to do when they set up the, what's called the Julian calendar. Okay? which got corrected uh, years later uh, with the Gregorian calendar, and that's what we use today. And with the Gregorian calendar, where they, they've analyzed things better, they realized that Jesus had to be born during the era of Herod the Great, because Herod the Great was alive. He died in 4 B.C. So we know that Jesus was born at least in 4 B.C. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So that cross came in the year of 30 AD, and on that day in history, a new covenant in his blood was given, right? Did, did not something start in 30 AD? What started in 30 AD? The church. Okay? As Jesus lifted up the cup, okay, on the night before his ex execution, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 30 says, says, For I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Always go to Israel first. With the cup, with the... And it won't be like the old covenant, says, says Jeremiah. For every man will know the law. You don't have to explain it to his... But they'll know it for... It will be in their heart, for he will forgive their sins and their trespasses. I'm loosely quoting Jeremiah 31, 31. <clears throat> now, so a new covenant was coming, and that new covenant was ushered in at the death of Jesus Christ. Okay, now, let's go back to the two days. If it was 30 A.D., 30 A.D. when Jesus died, and most historians agree, it was 30 A.D. when Jesus died. What year, how many years is it going to be in the year of 2030? 2,000 years. If a day is as a thousand years, you could make a good case for the return of Christ in the year of 2030. Also, we watched a pretty complicated but informative uh, study on the first words of the Bible. The first word in Hebrew is Bereshit. Remember that prophecy? Yeah. <clears throat> if you tear apart that, that prophecy, and I'm not uh, knowledgeable enough to explain it to you, but it comes up with the same date for the uh, arrival of Jesus Christ. It's all given in the first word of the Bible, Bereshit, which means in the beginning. Of course, Isaiah said that, that God knows the beginning from the end. 
And he said that in his very first words, Bereshit, the beginning and the end. In the beginning, God created. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross and the giving of the new covenant, okay, was point, being pointed forward to by Hosea. I mean, I'll get this. In his book, which I haven't got for you yet, Terry, but I'm going to. I talked to Pastor Bob Nero, most of us have that book, The Handwriting on the Wall. It refers to, to this scripture in Hosea and his timing. He establishes that Jesus was, in fact, okay, the Jewish Messiah and the Passover Lamb, right? When Jesus ascended into the heavens, the angel standing close by stated that he would return in the same manner in which he left. So Jesus is coming back. That's recorded for us in the New Testament. Nowhere in the, in the Old Testament does it talk about the Messiah returning. But where has Israel been for 2,000 years? In captivity. They've been out of the land. Until recently, and they're starting to come back in, in two days, he's going to revive them, or revisit them, and on the third day, he's going, they're going to live in his presence. Let's reread that scripture. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. Let's go back. Okay. Can I see where we're going with this? Kind of interesting, isn't it? John, in his writing of the revelation of Jesus Christ, stated that Jesus would return and reign for when? A thousand years. A thousand years. Third day. There's your third day. day. You can also see the third day in the writings of Daniel. Um, because Daniel talks about the 77s of Daniel. And the 70th, uh, the 70th week has never been fulfilled. So we know that there is a seven-year period of time that is dedicated to, if you read the book of Daniel, I didn't want to go all the way back into Daniel tonight. We'd be here for a long time, Barbara. So I didn't want to go all the way back into Daniel. But we all know we'll that wait. that 70th year was dedicated for 449 449 years, years, right? 490 years, there we go. 490 years were dedicated to the nation Israel, minus the seven-year period, yes. which brings it to 483 years. Well, chuk -a -chuk -a -chuk -a -chuk down the road, this is dedicated to Israel for 483 years from the time of Daniel, comes out to the same day that Jesus of Nazareth rode in to Jerusalem, and they proclaimed him as the Messiah. It's not on this tablet tonight, just a piece of information. So we know there's still a seven-year period that is left dangling out there. And of course, we know that that will be the time of Jacob's trouble, which is talked about in Jeremiah and other places throughout Old Testament Scripture. That God is not through with Israel. He will bring them back. What's the Scripture saying? After two days, he will revive us. He will bring them back. Let's go into Daniel prophet. Okay, wait a minute. This period of time correlates to the Jewish phrase, the age of the Messiah. It also correlates to Hosea's page 3. Uh, during that period of time, both Ephraim and Judah will be reunited as one Israel and will totally be serving God. However, let's, go, let's back up a little bit. Restoration for the nation of Israel will begin at a time which is spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Let's read it and weep because it's right here in front of us. At that time, because we're talking about what day it is, at that time, Michael shall stand up. That great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Day, uh, Daniel was a Jew. Jew. Wow, still have some old people in here that remember that. <laughs> Daniel was a Jew. So his people, are, we're talking about the nation Israel. And there should be a time of trouble, such as never was there a nation even to that time. Now here's an important part. And at that time, your people, what people? Israel, shall be delivered. 
everyone who's um, written in the book. We, so when will Israel be revisited? During that time of great trouble. We don't know if it's the, at the first of the, of the uh, blowing of the trumpets or in the middle of the blowing of the trumpet. We don't know, but it will be at that time. That day is not a day. That day is a time period. And that time period is a seven-year time period that, that Israel will be revived. You see the correlation now between Hosea, Daniel, Jeremiah, uh, Peter. It's all there in the scriptures. Yeah. And you just got to put it all together. And sometimes it gets a little complicated, but understand that God is not through with the nation Israel. Jesus, when he was asked, so when will these things happen? And what will be the signs of the times? And he said a lot of things. He said, uh, hey, you know, there's going to be a lot of things happening. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. There'll be pestilence. <coughs> Um, earthquakes. and earthquakes in diverse places. He gave a list of things that we can read in the newspaper and see are happening today before our very eyes. And he said, then he said, let, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. We didn't record that, but that's also in the same Daniel prophecy. Because at that time, your people will be delivered. What, what happens in the book of Revelation in, in chapter 7, before the blowing of the trumpets, God goes out and he takes 144,000 of pure Jews and he seals them for this time of great trouble that's coming upon the nation Israel. Will the whole world go through this? Yes, they will. We call it the great tribulation. And Jesus used the same words that Daniel the prophet used. He said, for there will be a time of trouble such as the, has never been before. Nation will rise up against nation. And he instructed the people in Judea. And I always read that scripture and I tell them this is, this is given to the Jew. Even though it's New Testament, it's being given to the Jew. I ask people, where do you live? Yaka. <laughs> well, this scripture is not for you. It says, if, for, if you're in Judea, here's what you do. Grab your coat and get to the mountains. Don't look back. Get out of Dodge, quick, because something's going to happen. At that time, your people will be delivered. Now, hear this, everybody. What does he mean when he says, though, everyone who is found written in the book? That's a whole other study. Everybody who's written in the book. That's debatable whether he's going to resurrect the iffy people. The good people, because it says, it goes on to say, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame. So it's hard to say because they didn't have the Christ. They rejected the Christ. I believe that this is what I believe. I, I can't prove so it dogmatically. Remember yeah. Judge hmm? Facebook. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't prove this dogmatically, but I believe that there's a lot of people who just ignored the scriptures of the time. They weren't bad at heart, but God will give them another chance, just like we get another chance. In Christ, there are many chances, and he's going to resurrect them. They will probably go through the Great Tribulation. He's going to bring them back. This, this is not the Great White Throne Judgment. People want to say, oh, there it is, the Great White Throne. No! That happens way after that time period. Well, after the thousand year run? After the thousand year millennium. Yeah. This is, this, is the, this is the beginning or the middle portion of the Great Tribulation, a time of Jacob's trouble. At that time, your people will be delivered. They're coming back. Everybody wants to know, how does God know who is Ephraim? Okay? Well, I think there's a lot of ways you can say God knows where he I can show you some scriptures over in Haggai uh, and Zechariah that kind of infer that some of the people stayed in the area. I can also say that right here, and in the book of Revelation chapter 7, that God is going to name 12,000 from each tribe. That if 10 of those tribes are lost tribes, then that means 10, uh, 10 times... Um, 144,000. Well, that's, that's the total group, but uh, just, just 10 times 12, 120,000 of them are going to be Ephraim and, and other tribes, and that's how they yeah. God knows where they all are. God knows. He's going to resurrect them. And he's going to seal a certain portion of them. 12,000 from each tribe. Well, let's read on. 
Now hear this. Day two of Hosea is pointing forward to the great day of tribulation that Israel will undergo. Let's go back and read the scripture. After two days, he will revive us. Interesting wording. Revive us. He's going to bring us back to life. That's day two. After two days. Two days from what? Two days from the cross. So the first wording points directly to the cross. But the actual timeline will be almost 2,700 years. But the second way of wording it is pointing to the cross. And after two days after the cross, he will revive us. It's quiet. After two days, he will revive us. We're talking now about a time of great tribulation that Israel is going to undergo. Now, God would be a liar in his word if he didn't allow the nation Israel to go through this tribulation period. You say, well, wait a minute. Why would God revive Israel only to put him through more tribulation? I'll tell you why. Because it's a time of purging. It's a time of cleansing. And it's going to be a time where God is going to uh, really speak to his people Israel because he's not done with them yet. And it has also been called that time of Jacob's trouble. And they still haven't accepted the Christ. And they still haven't accepted the Christ. But you get to the end and you see the 144,000 still with Jesus Christ up on the mountain, up on Mount Zion. And there's, there's the entire 144,000. Guess what? Didn't lose a one. This period of time is also the end of their chastisement. It's only another seven years. They've been out for thousands of years. It's referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. However, it is during this time that the nation will be completely purged and completely cleansed. You say, wow, Israel's really going through it, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And by the way, so is this entire world that has not accepted Jesus Christ and, and his blood on the cross. I'm sorry, but that's just the way the Bible's. You know, I didn't write the book. I'm trying like I can to, to explain it. At the end of that seven year period of time, Israel comes through it. And what do they do? The Messiah comes back. And they enter the age of the Messiah. That's what they call it in the Old Testament. It's the Messianic reign, the age of the Messiah. We call it the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. Of course, we know from our scriptures that we too will be there. That, that we will be there because so shall we forever be with the Lord, says the scripture of the rapture. At the end of that seven year period of time, Israel entered the age of the Messiah. When does all this happen? 2,000 years after the cross. They enter into the age of the Messiah after two days. And after two days, on day three, and on the third day, Jesus, we know, rose from the grave. See the wording? And Hosea said that on the third day, he will raise us up. You've, you've almost got to be blind not to see that parallel after I've explained it to you. I think. I mean, to me, it just jumped out. It just jumped out. But you won't find it. I didn't find that anywhere. Um, I'm serious. It just uh, the bear sheet between the bear sheet prophecy and Pastor Bob's uh, book. It just jumps out at you. It's, and I'm not setting a date for our rapture or anything like that. But I am saying there's a good case in Scripture, in Scripture with Hosea, Daniel, Jeremiah, uh, Peter, Matthew. And then, then our dating system, the year of 2030, and 2,000 years. But that would be the 2,000 years. But that would be pointing to the 2,000 mm -hmm. years. It is sort of strange. Do you remember Y2K, everybody? Yeah. yeah. Yes. There were so many people that were sure, hey, it's 2,000 years since Jesus was born. But that's not what, that's not what Scripture points to. It points to 2,000 years from the cross. And a lot of, there are a lot of disappointed uh, Baptist preachers who are probably doing just like I'm doing, 
Okay, saying, hey, get ready. Year 2000, we're out of here. <laughs> we thought a whole bunch of things were going to happen. Remember that? Everybody's preparing for a this or a that. Kind of like we're doing right now. 30 years, but, uh, 20, 20, 23, 22 years before now. I know I, I didn't have a well, so I filled an above ground swimming pool. I bought tons five, of tons, five <laughs> tons of wheat. I still got that, by the way. It's still good wheat. I stored it. Um, I bought a bunch of solar panels. I never learned how to hook them up. Quonset Hut. Quonset Hut. This was all Y2K. This was all Y2K, yeah. So they're not really good solar panels. I bought a whole bunch of batteries, but after, <laughs> when I realized about $1,000 worth of batteries, but they didn't last the 22 years. Uh, so I should have read my scripture. But see, we've been sharpening our pencil now for 22 years. But that's 2000. That was the year 2000. 2500. Jesus can come back. By the way, that scripture about the rapture means the eminent, eminent part of it just means he will definitely do it. That's what eminent means. It's going to happen, okay? Keep your now, eye on Israel. It means it's ready to happen. In the last days, neither to say, all eyes shall be on Jerusalem. It won't be on China, it won't, Russia will be involved, yeah. okay, because I believe that that's the God of Magog, but nonetheless, all eyes will be on Israel, okay, as Israel, as, as Russia moves from the north, um, but anyway, I don't, I don't want to get too heavy into that. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. I have a question. One question. Um, <laughs> growing up, we were always taught the beginning of World War III would be the end of times. So, well, there is going to be a World War III. It's going to be fought in the Great Tribulation. Okay, it may begin in our time, and we might even see the movement of of that. It starts, I believe. Well, I believe this is my personal that. belief that it begins in Ezekiel thirty-eight. Okay, when Russia comes against Israel, and then. God miraculously protects Israel, but that's not, that's just the first battle. This is right, like and a lot of people believe that. that's in the middle of the tribulation too. So you can't be dogmatic and say it, it happens at the beginning. But there will be a World War Three, okay? Uh, and that's the time when, if God didn't intervene, no flesh would have survived. Yeah. God's going to allow mankind and the enemy, who will be controlling mankind, to basically kill everything on planet Earth. And Jesus said, unless, unless that time was shortened by him, no flesh would survive. That therein is the great tribulation. It's horrible. It's not something you're going to go out in the desert with a BB gun or any, any cannons that you can muster and get your way through. Because even the water will become polluted. But we're yes. real close to a, a war right now. We're real close to a war. We're on the fringe of all this. Right now, I believe. Oh, yes. Yeah, but Jesus said there would be rumors of war. Mm -hmm. Wars, rumors of war, the oh, earthquakes yeah. in diverse places. I don't think, personally, we've seen enough diverse earthquakes. Diverse simply means not in Jerusalem, not in Israel. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they're all. They're having them in the middle of the ocean right now. They're having them, the tsunamis. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of that's because we're being able to record more yeah. Uh, yeah. earthquakes and whatnot. Okay. And so we're aware of it. Uh, Maybe it's so people's eyes will open up a little bit more and realize God is not fooling them. Let's move on because I get kicked out of here if I don't get to page four. <laughs> hey, I'm only covering three verses tonight. Chop, chop. Chop, chop. Let us know. By the way, Hosea is still in his prayer. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning he will come to us like the rain, like the latter rain and the former rain to the earth. Okay. Yeah. This is hard to say, you know. I, next, next week, next week, I want to give you a little bit of uh, the Pentecostal movement that came out of this scripture and the Joel scripture that parallels with it. Uh, it, it was a heavy Pentecostal movement, and it carried its way all the way through. Anybody ever hear of holy laughter? Yes. Yeah. It's it's really a lot of the stuff that came out of the interpretation of the latter rain, okay, almost 
predicted a, a race of super Christians. Okay, if you didn't speak in tongues, you weren't a Christian, uh, and a lot of things that came out of that simply aren't scriptural. However, I don't put any of my Pentecostal brothers down for the movement of the Spirit and all that, but they interpreted this, uh, and they took it so much into their church that they tried to make super Christians out of everybody by saying God is coming super. I think it's just a, good enough that we know that we're headed, what we're headed toward. We don't have to all of a sudden be something we're not. Just be sold out to Jesus Christ. Okay? You don't have to roll in the aisles. You don't have to speak in tongues. You don't have to laugh. Holy laughter. People would come in at the Pensacola Church and they would just laugh through the entire service. Nothing was ever taught. Nothing was ever lifted up. What and But they, that came out of the Holy Reign era. What do we do if we have to roll in the aisles? Oh, not the Holy Reign. <laughs> the, the latter <laughs> <laughs> Reign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, rolling in the aisles isn't we'll, something here that we... Would somebody do. please get Barbara up? Yeah. <laughs> Either that or put carpeting down. <laughs> So let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord, it says. His going forth is established as the morning. When did he go forth? He went forth on the cross. Okay, that's when he went. And we're considering that morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. Now interpret this scripture in light of the scriptures that we just read a few minutes ago, because it's all coming from the same place. It's not like we're just looking at one individual scripture. The concept of viewing uh, two, uh, of viewing verse two, as a messianic prophecy and prayer for repentance is now continued in verse three. As it continues, Hosea prays to know and to pursue the knowledge of the Lord. I pray tonight that that's what we're doing. We're, we're pursuing yes. the knowledge of the Lord because we're putting one scripture on top of another scripture on top of another scripture on top of another scripture. So many people take one scripture out of context and build an entire uh, belief system out of it. So, I won't go into names. In Hosea 4.6, two weeks ago, God stated that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Remember that one? Yeah. However, after the restoration, his people will be filled with the wonderful things or knowledge of God. During the Messianic era, which we will call the 1,000 year reign of Christ, Israel will be in complete compliance. All you got to do is read Ezekiel chapter, uh, oh, I'm sorry, a new temple will be constructed. All you got to do to get that is read Ezekiel 40 through 42 and read 42 through the end. And you'll find that everything, uh, proper worship, proper governance, everything will be restored in the land of Israel. There won't be one amongst them who is not serving God. And that's hard to imagine. It really is hard to imagine. Yes. Uh, you asked a question, I believe it was you, a few weeks ago. Uh, is it just the nation Israel that all these things are going to happen that we read about in Joel and, and we read about some the other week where the, the, in Isaiah where it says the, the viper will be with the child, the lion will lie down with the lamb. lamb. And I said, I'm not sure, but all the indications are that during the messianic reign, that's the picture of what Israel's going to look like. Mm -hmm. But will the whole earth be like that? No, because it does not align with, with Zechariah chapter 14, where, where Jesus is sitting on the throne, and he's saying everybody in the whole world must come to celebrate uh, Sukkot in Jerusalem. And if you don't come to celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles, right. Sukkot, then I will cause you, I will not cause it to rain on your land. Okay? So the whole earth can't be that way during the great, during the, uh, uh, well, maybe it the, is just the millennial reign of Christ. And also at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, what happens? The whole world, if not most of the world, I should say, rises up against Christ and attacks him into attacks Jerusalem for the final time, and God comes along and does away with all of them. And go to Revelation says, and after the great white throne judgment, there was found no place for them, meaning those people who for six thousand, seven thousand years never came to recognize God as God. 
They came against him even after 7,000 years. So no, I think the, the, the land that was given, I understand Israel is promised a land. Yes. And that land is far bigger than far bigger than the one that they're living yes, in right, right now. <laughs> in fact, I get a kick out of Mike Lindell and his Giza sheets because he shows yeah. that picture. It is the same picture that I, I gave to you guys about uh, the land of Goshen. Actually, in all yes. the time they were in Egypt, they were living in their promised land. Israel never claimed all its land. No, Israel never claimed all their land. They never never took it. So, but in the end, I think they will have all that land. Well, the nation Israel. Yes. And but the rest of the world will be like the rest of the world, with one ruler who will be a righteous God. Guess what? Not everybody likes a righteous leader. Uh, a lot of people don't like Trump. I don't know why, but they don't like him. <laughs> so much Trump. Facebook. <laughs> <clears throat> Said one of those bad words. Okay. Because he's uh, arrogant. Okay. Well, let's read. Not only would God restore Israel, it's the last paragraph, guys, stick with me. See why I only did four? I knew this was going to get complicated. Not only would God restore Israel back to what they were originally called to be, he would cause them to grow both in knowledge and in spirit. You see? He prayed for that. He would come to us like rain. Now, Israel's sustenance in the day of Hosea, uh, came when God brought forth the rain. That's kind of going to blow you guys away. Go to this part. Brought forth the rain. Without the rain, crops would not grow. That's pretty simple. Okay, makes sense. The rains came in two forms, as did the re revival. Rains came in form. The former rains refer to the rains in autumn, kind of opposite from what we would think. We would think the former rains would be in spring and then the the latter rains would be maybe in the fall. Or Remember, Israel's new year begins at when? Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is celebrated in yes. September. In the fall of the year come the, the former rains, and it rains and waters the land so that it can be tilled and, and worked under. Okay? The latter rains came in the spring, which is again a reference to what? To the Passover. Passover happens on the first full moon of the month of Nisan, and it always falls in the fall, okay? Which comes in the spring. Uh, in referencing the rains, the prophet Joel states that the latter rains will come to them, get this, in the first month. Come on, everybody. When is the first month? When is the first month of the spiritual year? Nisan. Is it not? Come on, what month is it? Nisan. Nisan, that's right. Nisan 14th, Jesus died at the full moon, which is Passover moon, in the spring. Jesus paid the penalty for the sins of the whole world, and on that day, the church age began. Now, I'm going to go through the book of Revelation in about three sentences. The book of Revelation outlines this church age in its first three chapters. However, in Revelation chapter 4, now we know Jesus is walking through all the churches and he's, he's talking about the church. It's Don's fault. It's Don's fault. I saw the way he was stiffening up there. I knew that was coming. I get excited. Okay. The book of Revelation outlines the church age in this first three chapters, right? Jesus is walking through all the, the churches. However, Revelation 4.1, after these things, metatanta is the Greek word, metatanta, metatanta, after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me saying, come up here. Who's he talking to in the church? Here's John, and he hears the words, a, a door opens up, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place metatanta after these things. I believe this is a picture of the rapture of the church. Some people don't. That's okay. I believe it is a picture of the rapture of the church. The next scene in Revelation is a picture of, of the church around the throne of God and a vision of who? 
the lamb that was slain. So we're moving pretty fast. After that, John sees and describes four riders of the apocalypse. Ooh, something's happening that's not too good. And the great tribulation begins. After the great tribulation, and we're not going to go through all that tonight, because I only go four sentences, <laughs> Jesus returns to establish his kingdom on earth. Through him, on day three, which is in the seventh hour of our history, the 7,000th year of since the cross. On day three of Hosea's prophecy and the latter rains. See how the latter rains ties into all the scriptures that we just read tonight? Kind of cool. Huh? I don't know. I just, I have a good time with this. Don and Joe were working me like a dog. <laughs> I didn't have much time. To, I read that scripture. I, I can't go any further. Good. I can't go any further because I was going to write now about a whole bunch of other stuff. And, and <laughs> I said, so yeah, well, we'd be here. Yeah, it, get, it, it still gets good. But the prophecy part of it that we just read tonight, it correlates with so many scriptures in our Bible. And that's what you kind of look for. You, you don't always just pick out one scripture and say, there it is, and then ignore everything else. God, God had a whole, all these prophets for a reason. And he spoke through each prophet and gave them a little piece of the puzzle. And God says, seek me and you shall find me. You don't seek if you have only one scripture you're hanging on to. Now, I don't know when the rapture is going to be. I don't know. But a good case could be made for the return of Christ. I'm not even saying that. I'm saying but a good case could be made with the scriptures we looked at tonight for the return of Christ in the year of 2030. You told me a good case. That's what he said. I didn't renew my driver's license. <laughs> I don't want to make that. Okay. Darn it, now i got to make what more house payments. Okay, so if I you're want. believing in the 2023 thing, if you want to believe that, <laughs> okay, why would you believe that? Why? Because... The seven, years. the seven years is the time of Jacob's trouble. Yep. Were we in the first 483 years of the 77 prophecies of Daniel? No, the church wasn't even around. For this, this 77s of Daniel, the 70 year period, 77 groups of years comes to 490 years. We were not around for the first 483 years it was dedicated to the nation Israel. That's what Daniel said. That 77's grouping of years is dedicated to the nation Israel. For your people Israel. Not for the church. So if we weren't there for that, and, and by the way, that 483 years again correlates to the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they proclaimed him as the Messiah on the day that we call Palm Sunday. So if if you want to take that scripture and believe that this last seven years, which is also throughout scripture dedicated as a time for Jacob's trouble, and say, well, we're not part of that Jacob thing, then you might want to go for the year 2023 and believe in a pre-trib pre -trib rapture, okay, that we don't go through the great tribulation. Another case could be made for, okay, that we do go through the first three and a half years that God doesn't actually pour out his wrath, his bowls of wrath, until mid-trip. So a good case could be made for a mid-trip as well. I personally believe and want to believe and hold on tight to the Amen. fact that we weren't there for the first 483 years. We will not be there for the next. So, uh, but get your driver's license. Maybe. I was going to say, it's not That means hard. i got to make more than a year's worth of house yeah. payments? Yeah. It goes, it goes yeah. against yeah. everything. Yeah. I'm 23, and I'm in December, so I thought, I got it made. I don't have to renew. It goes against everything that Paul said to the Thessalonians when he cautioned them. He says, continue until that day. Okay? We are to continue with everything that we're doing. Are we going to build a pantry? Yeah. I know that there's not going to be any anything happening in that pantry because we're out of here in 2023. No, we don't know that day for a very specific reason. You know, sin is fun, and it's too it's fun to a lot of 
Christians do. And we know that. And so I'll just wait. I know when the date's going to be. So I'll just be as bad as I can. But the day before, I'll go in and, and say my Hail Marys or whatever i got to say and get straight with the Lord. I just know all those poor people in Phoenix that have to go get rebaptized. I know. <laughs> okay. Stay away from that one. Another, another thing for being ready all the time, not knowing when, is that we're still an example and still have to spread the gospel. Amen. 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 That's right. Right up to the end. If we knew the time. If we knew the time before that, we'll quit. That's right. Amen. I mean, it's human nature. So right. we have to continue to, step, to spread the word. Right. We have to continue with the pantry, not only for ourselves, but for those that can be left behind. <laughs> That's right. right. They're going to really need that pantry. <laughs> yeah. Some of those things we're going, some of them may not be going at all, so we'll have to redo. That's right. You know, we'll still have to work for us. still got to prepare those <laughs> that are going to be behind. As you guys heard from this, I still have five tons of wheat in my house. So... <laughs> We'll Didn't get rid of it, and it's still good. Some fell on the some fell on the we ground a few years we back. Can get to it. Some fell on the ground a few years back because the buckets had broken, and wheat grew up, so it's still alive. It's still working, huh? Still alive. We just don't know what to do with it. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for your word, Lord, that you do give us a piece and a piece and a piece and a piece. And Lord, it's fun putting your puzzle together. And you're probably sitting there laughing at us as we try to stick the wrong piece in the wrong place. But Lord, it's kind of just fun looking at your scriptures and see where it's leading us to. I do ask for protection over all of us, Lord, as we go our way uh, tonight, uh, back to our homes, and just protect and keep each and every one of us. Special prayer for, for Gloria and Marshall as they're recovering from, from uh, <coughs> losing a son. Lord, you know how that feels. So, Father, we, we, we lift uh, them up to you before your throne. Special prayer for those people that are sick, or, or yeah. Terry and, and uh, Perry. Yes. Terry and Perry's around here. Perry and Terry and uh, Chris Cole. Lord. We just thank you again in the name of Jesus. Tonight. Amen. 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 Pastor, you know you've got to be right.